I want to talk about, and I don't really want to, I would like a discussion about it, uh, if that's possible, is those components of the psychedelic experience which exceed either the psychedelic uh, paradigm or raise the issue of violations of some kind of larger paradigm. And... Uh, there are two areas where this is noticeable and uh, one is fairly common in the literature and that's the report of telepathic phenomena and that sort of thing which has been persistently a uh, repressed sub-theme in psychedelic research ever since Havelock Ellis began experimenting with mescaline and the other thing is uh, a constellation of issues that seem to me related, although they may not seem related to you, and we touched on this this afternoon in Stan's talk, which is the question of the extraterrestrial connection, or whatever it is, and uh, what do these things mean. Um, the first thing I want to say about all this is there's been a phrase used by several people which is the full spectrum of psychedelic effects people will tell you at what dose the full spectrum of psychedelic effects occurs or we heard yesterday that LSD elicits the full spectrum of psychedelic effects but in fact there is no catalog of psychedelic effects and how does one know what the full spectrum is it's, uh, it's a very tricky matter. What I have uh, encountered at fairly high doses of, uh, of psilocybin and on DMT, but strangely on nothing else, that uh, I find very interesting is the whole problem of uh, interiorized voices relationships with hidden agencies of uncertain parameters and related to that uh, states that I think uh, the vocabulary we inherit from the religious systems that we've recently overthrown leave us with nothing to say about them but that they're states of possession and the word demonic has been used but not defined and it's somehow it's a form of uh, negativity that is not seen to be operational, but it's very upsetting, nevertheless, to people. So what, uh, what I find and what I think is generally part of the shamanic uh, practice of taking mushrooms is uh, that at, f at fairly low doses, meaning I can't speak of pure psilocybin, but at five dried grams, it's very easy to invoke a, a uh, voice, a kind of logos-like phenomenon, which is, operates as the typical uh, hierophant. It's the teaching voice. It's Virgil to Dante. It's a, a very large and superior force which takes you by the hand and then narrates uh, the various scenarios that you're conveyed through. And the trick, of course, is the trick that's uh, such a conundrum of the literature of involvement with demons and devils, which is the trick is to get something out of it and get away clean. <laughs> and uh, the, way, the way that works operationally when trysting with the mushroom voice is it's the challenge to get it to tell you something that you're sure you didn't know already <laughs> so that you can have some validation that you're not just talking to the back of your head. <laughs> and though this sounds trivial at first, as you move into the dialogue with the other, it becomes apparent that it's, uh, it's going to be uh, elusive. Mercurial is a word that suggests itself. Now, another aspect of the, of the psilocybin intoxication, which may or may not be related to this, 
and that I have sort of, I guess, insisted upon more than anybody else is that it triggers phenomena having to do with the language centers. Uh, Henry Munn, in a book called Hallucinogens and Shamanism, edited by Michael Harner, talks about this. And I went to some length to talk to him about it. And I found out that, that uh, though he agreed with my opinions on the subject, he didn't hold them nearly as strongly as I did. That for him it had been a fairly elusive and upsetting phenomenon. But uh, this is a form of glossolalia that I really am convinced is uh, an affect of, of tryptamines that is a psychedelic affect that I don't believe it happens with anything else. At least it doesn't happen in my experience with anything else. And the literature doesn't mention anything like this. It does not happen uh, with ayahuasca, even though chemically you would think ayahuasca would... Uh, would have the same uh, properties as the other tryptamine hallucinogens. And so I want to describe uh, a, partic a, a typical encounter with this phenomenon because uh, a client has had this experience over a dozen times and it's almost always unvarying. The problem is the client happens to be myself. <laughs> so. Uh, Getting independent confirmation that this could happen to someone else has not been very easy. Nevertheless, I operate under the faith that there's nothing unique about me and that anything I could experience is a generally accessible human phenomenon. I mean, I think it would be preposterous to operate under any other kind of assumption. In giving DMT to people casually over a number of years, only four people have, uh, have reported the kind of phenomenon that I'm interested in. And of course, every single one of them had been primed by me. <laughs> <laughs> Never <clears throat> Nevertheless, the experience is of such an ontologically different modality that it's different, difficult to see how, cute, how you could cue it to somebody. They would, they would have to have it. And what it involves is uh, a transformation of language into something which is no longer sound decoded by brain through the consultation of a culturally uh, 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 validated dictionary. But instead it becomes sound which is beheld and meaning which is beheld. And this idea of a visible language when it first came to me or when I first realized that that was the phrase I was going to have to use to describe what was happening, I had never heard or imagined of such a thing. But then I went back into the literature and I discovered that uh, as usual, the Greeks got there first, or at least in this case, the, the Jewish Greeks or the Greek Jews, because in Philo Judaeus, who was a contemporary of Christ, there's a discussion of what he calls the more perfect logos. And he says, the more perfect logos will be apprehended through seeing, not through hearing. And yet it will cross from being heard to being seen without ever going through a noticeable moment when it shifts from one modality to the other. And this seems to be what is happening uh, in, in the DMT flash when you smoke the free base, not the hydrochloride, but when you smoke the free base, uh, you have this spontaneous experience of generating what you identify first as a thought and then as a sound, but which eventually becomes uh, some kind of synesthetic linguistic modality for which we don't have words yet. Uh, telepathy I always conceived of as looking into your own mind and hearing what someone else was thinking. But the notion that telepathy 
might be someone speaking and producing a three-dimensional object in the air that could be rotated and mutually be held by the speaker and the, uh, the listener had never occurred to me. But experiment with the DMT showed that this extraordinary kind of state is actually potentially triggerable again and again. And it is, um, it's almost as though there is a sensorium of the world which in order to be reconstructed in the interior horizon of transcendence that is the being of a given individual, the sensorium has to be arbitrarily broken down into its perceptual components of sound, sight, odor, tactility, etc. And normally as it enters the human organism, these categories which are arbitrary but as old as the human body itself are maintained but they need not necessarily be maintained the incoming sensory data can be recombined in such a way that no trace of the uh, portal of entry is left upon it and in that case you get this freely evolving topology of light and sound that is uh, translinguistic. It is, it has a, uh, a grammar of form, if you will, so that it is not shorn of meaning. It is simply shorn of uh, the kind of particularized meaning that logical necessity imposes on language. Instead, it has an emotional richness a, a kind of poetic depth that is not like ordinary language at all and in fact uh, causes one to think of discussions of primary poetic languages such as the one that goes on in The White Goddess by, by uh, Robert Graves where he wants to suggest that there is a, a, a proto-language, an Ursprach that transcends conventionalized dictionaries, a language which to hear it is to understand it. And I think that this kind of organization of information lies at the, at the basis of the psychedelic experience. In other words, you can think of cultural uh, conventions and human languages as uh, software languages that are historical adumbrations of an assembly language which is prehistoric and probably in the genes and antedates uh, uh, all notion of human conventionalizing of activity and is actually biologically uh, the basis of language. As I said in the opening remarks that if you want to see the thumbprint of God in the world it seems to me the phenomenon of human language is where you look. I mean, human language is a psychic ability. I can make thoughts in your head by simply uttering certain small mouth noises. And the degree of fineness of the images that I can produce in your head and you in mine through the use of small mouth noises is something which we're still exploring. I think that... Uh, you know, it's well known that the human animal has not appreciably evolved uh, in 50 or 60,000 years, possibly much longer. Once culture was established, the, the uh, soma of, of uh, the human species was relatively stabilized. Then change was no longer genetic. It became epigenetic, and you get just as the stability sets in in the animal form, you begin to get this fantastic proliferation of, of epigenetic uh, change in the form of the evolution of culture, languages, alphabets. It all seems to be related somehow to the encoding of information. And, in the, and the psychedelic state also seems to be about the revelation of kinds of information which are normally either not efficacious or unavailable for other reasons. And it is not that culture 
is evolving. The evolution of culture is an epiphenomenon attendant upon the evolution of language. Language is the part of man which is evolving. Culture carries along. Um, at the present moment, we are able to speak 21st century ideas to each other, but our culture is carrying along at about the 1950s level. Nevertheless, it seems to me that this thing which psilocybin does to the language producing part of the brain is not then some mere affect, some trivial affect of an obscure hallucinogen on, an, on a uh, uh, peripheral part of the brain. It means that it is in fact a catalyst for evolution because it is a catalyst for the evolution of language. We are not going to move into the future until we create that future through language. And the hardest thing to cause to change is language. It has an immense inertia because it is so unself-reflective of itself. And this is what we need to inject into it, is an element of self-reflection so that the evolution of language can become more conscious and less random, because it's the non-randomizing of the evolution of language that will give us a real hold on the kinds of social modalities that we want to produce in the future. Now, I don't know if the, uh, the tryptamine-induced glossolalia will have a major role to play in that. It may be simply one of the many <coughs> promising scintillas or sparks thrown off by the psychedelic experience that invites exploration. But certainly all of these things, the chanting, the glossolalia, the inner discourses with alien forces, the self-examination of one's own motives, all of these things are linguistic activities and go on in the context of uh, linguistic action. It seems to me that what these drugs synergize is cognitive activities of all sorts. This is why originally they were called consciousness expanding drugs. And this synergy of cognitive activity has to be taken very, very seriously because it's having a massive effect on our society. As individuals, we tend to concentrate on the six to 12 hours following the ingestion of a given drug. But the real impact is a societal impact that is spread out over decades. And I don't think that there's any question at all but what the, uh, the best part of the social program of the LSD reformers of the 60s has been enacted uh, in large measure. It's simply that it's at a profane level, not pleasing to the purest. But I see, I believe that people have deeper and subtler senses of humor. I think people have uh, more refined aesthetic uh, sensitivity. I think people have a greater sensitivity to the <coughs> mysteries of human interaction simply because so much LSD was taken in the 60s. And these are permanent changes that will not be wiped out. Our language is largely uh, uh, in the place where it was left by about 1969. And we, and, but from the period of 1959 to 69, dozens of concepts and notions, uh, ego trip, bummer, uh, flashback, uh, rupture of plane, all of these terms were invented that allowed a handle on uh, the experience. And essentially, the whole, um, the whole 20th century cultural experience has been an effort to create languages um, sufficient, of sufficient power to give descriptions of the internal transcendence of being as we experienced it in the present at hand. And Stan touched on this this afternoon, the Freudian uh, uh, interest in the uh, repression of desire and the placement of, uh, of the critical period in childhood 
in other words, out of the present, but still within the context of the life of the experient. And then Jung tie, bringing in, trying to say, well, it's that, but it's more than that, and bringing in the notion of a collective unconscious. But what these, it isn't that these guys were describing the unconscious, or d limiting or delineating the unconscious. It was that they were going through linguistic forms of metamorphosis in an attempt to describe what was a black box, which essentially I think still eludes them because though the Jungian model and was fairly satisfying, I think uh, by we'll say uh, the middle 40s, it was just at that time that then these psychedelic agents began coming on. And what they show is that if we keep the Freudian term, the unconscious, then huge portions of the unconscious seem to have very little to do with human beings, individually or collectively. And that... Uh, large portions of the unconscious present themselves more like a topological manifold. In other words, more like a place that is no more interested in the traumas or repressed wish fulfillment of human beings than boulders, wild flowers, and waterfalls are interested in these things. In other words, the unconscious began to take on the character of a dimension rather than a... Uh, a repository of energy that seemed to be instead something deployed spatially that could be entered into and immediately of course the literatures and traditions and mythologies of the world were searched and we discovered yes shamanism there is a tradition of a of a therapeutic practitioner who in order to cure his patient or himself goes to a place and then there are many descriptions. It's either an ascent through uh, cosmic levels or a descent uh, uh, into an inferno or into the center of the earth or into a cavern. But the stress was on the spatial metaphor that it was a place. And uh, I think that the psychedelics are beginning to confirm this in a way that's very hard for us to assimilate. In other words, it seems as though the science fiction metaphor of another dimension is actually in some ways more applicable than these uh, reductionist uh, models which wanted to say, well, it's uh, a representation of a certain symptomatology or it's a representation of a certain past event system. It doesn't seem to be like that. And it raises questions about the relationship of the mind to the body, which I talked about the first night, that are very interesting. One of the things, again, that Stan touched on this afternoon was what he called synchronistic events attendant upon taking psychedelic drugs. And this means uh, that you take a psychedelic drug and then someone you've been thinking of who lives far away shows up at your doorstep this kind of thing. Jung, the word synchronicity was coined by Jung and it means a meaningful coincidence. But I think it was P.D. Bridgman who said uh, that uh, a coincidence is what you have left over when you apply a bad theory. And there can be, <laughs> and there can be just so many of these meaningful coincidences <laughs> before somebody has to stand up and say, you know, hell, this can't be coincidences, meaningful or otherwise, something else is happening here. And on psilocybin, and I, th and I think it's, you know, based on anecdotal material, but I think it's generally true of other psychedelics in varying degrees, the synchronistic component is more like a poltergeist phenomenon. It's as though there are small eddies of autonomous psychic energy that disturb the periphery of awareness. In other, it's, the, it's the rats in the wall phenomenon. <laughs>
the you know the scratchings, the rustlings, the uh, fire flarings need to be studied. Uh, the phenomenon of people lying on floors silent for hours and then sitting up at the very moment that the fire flares, the window blows open, the baby cries, almost as though there are waves of compression of uh, coincidence, connectedness, what is it? I'm not sure. Who is this control? Something like that, that move through a, uh, a modality. So all of these things suggest that, uh, that actually we don't know what we're doing with the uh, psychedelics, that because things that you put into your mouth that are not foods must necessarily be medicines, we have assigned these things to our doctors to explain to us. And I noticed uh, in the first talk this afternoon, it was said, well, there's the, uh, the uh, schizotoxin, the theory that, you know, the psychotomimetic theory. Then there's also the theory that these things induce religious experiences. But so did the psychiatrists who figured this out immediately step aside and make room for priests? Or what was the conclusion of that model of how it should be done? So I don't think they are... Uh, I think it's odd that our reaction to them was to immediately say, well, if you're dying of cancer, we'll give it to you. If you're seriously neurotic, you can be put on the waiting list. Everybody else hit the streets if you're interested. <laughs> there is this notion, you know, that, uh, that what we all experience is mental health and certainly doesn't require any drug intervention because it, in fact, is normality. But, but uh, Jung and others have had, you know, the, more the idea of an open-ended process, that there is an unlimited potential for understanding and for coming to terms with being in the world and for opening up to other people. And, uh, and I think that uh, it would be very interesting to take the approach that these things should be uh, restricted to people of even <coughs> exceptional ability. That uh, going along with winning the Nobel Prize was uh, your license to possess and take psychedelics uh, and to <laughs> hand them out to your friends. It's interesting that uh, when this was all being hashed out at the very beginning, it was Huxley, it was Aldous Huxley's notion that this is how it should be done. He said, you know, engineers, artists, diplomats, administrators, people must be exposed to these things. And then somewhere along the line, I think personalities arose with messianic tendencies. And the notion became that you would count success in millions of followers rather than in the quality of the people who were taking it. And that proved, uh, you know, a sad thing because the society in which that conception arose had a demographic bulge in the 12 to 30 year old group and it just all ended uh, rather badly. So, um, as I said at the beginning, there's no conclusion about all of this stuff. It is the frontier. There is a very large frontier. We're very fond of the notion of an ever-expanding sphere of understanding. But has anyone stopped to notice that if you have an ever-expanding sphere of understanding, necessarily the surface volume of the frontier of the unknown becomes larger and larger. <laughs> so, you know, it's like building a bonfire bigger and bigger to convince yourself that there is an awful lot of darkness. So I think, uh, you know, the key to getting around the cultural momentum that has placed us in this position is to return to the Baconian method, which is simply the collection of facts 
and the examination of them until patterns emerge and that then the major datum for thinking about the, the psychedelic experience it should be the experience and that the, the pharmacology and all of these things they will elucidate uh, uh, operational details of how these things function at the wetware level but they will never elucidate the component which is beheld by the experient in confrontation with the drug in fact it's silly to demand that of them because that's not the kind of information that they are able to deliver in fact no system of thought is able to uh, deliver that kind of a description that has to come from the individual and that's why I, I am fond of speaking of these things of, as deconditioning agents because what they show you is that you know each man each woman their own Magellan you need no longer participate in a in a pyramid of information where it's filtering down to you from the scientific, medical, governmental, and military elite being explained by CBS, NBC, and Newsweek, and Time, you can discover actually that the adventure of being is not a cultural adventure, it's not a societal adventure, it's a personal adventure. And that this is what you really need to be involved in. And I, I, all this is happening. This is why shamanism has gained such a hold, because it's a, a metaphor for, uh, for personal responsibility. And I think we all take personal responsibility for our, the evolution of our worldview. Psychedelic people, I'm referring to, take responsibility for the evolution of their worldviews. But still, we operate under the shadow of what's right to say about it and what's not right to say about it. For instance, the UFO thing is a, is a cultural taboo and not believed in by uh, nice, intellectually nice people. It's more the province of telephone line repairmen and uh, <laughs> uh, that sort of uh, slice. But the fact of the matter is that uh, no matter how much it may discomfort drug researchers and UFO people, because each is struggling to gain respectability in an inherently dubious field, <laughs> but actually, you know, there would be a, I think there would be a fertile advance made if these two groups could talk to each other. Uh, some people hearing me say that must wonder what in the world I'm talking about. How can a problem of, uh, of unidentified aircraft be related to the phenomenology of the psychedelic experience? But you see, it isn't so much a problem of unidentified aircraft. It's a problem of not recognizing that the entire uh, spectrum of existence is embedded in a linguistic model that is created by uh, the workings of minds and that mind is an imponderable and yet it's set at the beginning of the equation. Uh, in 1978, a very a spectacular daylight meteorite crossed the United States from east to west required about 35 seconds for it to go from one side of the country to the other there was no warning that this thing would occur. And uh, in the 35 seconds that it was over the continental United States, thousands and thousands of people saw it. But we got 32 very good photographs of it from different points along the ground, two movies of it from two different points along its pathway, and uh, it was very well documented. Uh, UFOs have been visiting people and appearing all over the world for 30 years and the hardware faction can't come up with anything. So it seems clear to me that what we're dealing with is a kind of mass psychic phenomenon of some sort. And it's very interesting that uh, one of the 
anecdotal things in circulation about psychedelics is that they are actually uh, catalysts for this kind of thing. And what this means is not clear, but it should certainly be investigated. I mean, if there's a chemical agent which can repeatedly trigger a phenomenon that bizarre, it should be looked at. Jung very early suggested in a book called Flying Saucers, a myth, a, a modern myth of things seen in the sky that he published in 1948, that it was in fact um, a projection of the mass psyche, that it was uh, assimilable to the goals of alchemical uh, transubstantiation. He called it the rotunda, the scintilla, the spark, the spinning thing. And it is, it's all these things, but it is, it is the clue that we are somehow trapped inside some kind of artifice, that, that uh, the world that we're inside of is much more like a work of art than it is like the smooth running mechanistic machine that Newtonian science describes. That description works very well for all low-grade phenomena up to about the level of the weather. But from there on, the, the notion that the world is simply, uh, you know, probabilistic processes following these various creodes of least resistance becomes very uh, untenable because each of us in our experience of being lives in a highly theatrical world. And what I mean by that is that you can see a woman at a great distance from you in class, in uh, opportunity, all of these things, and uh, you fall in love with this woman, and it's hopeless. But of course, as we all know, it's also inevitable. And that inevitability totally violates physics, because it really is hopeless. How is it then that each of our lives is a work of art, of unbelievable chance encounters, coincidences, and uh, wishes projected onto the world but never spoken and strangely fulfilled in the oddest ways? I think that it's because uh, the world is made of language and that if the Eastern conception that the universe is mind has any operational impact in the world, it will be through conceiving of mind as uh, the underlying self-aware, self-active, world-forming grammar of being. So that the, the, what Freud called the superego, what I call the overmind, there have been different ways of talking about it, has to be seen not as a passive homeostatic controlling device, but actually as the most intelligent organization on this planet. And we are all only components of this, believing ourselves to be the highest expression of freedom. But it is actually at the species level that organization is controlled. And that's why the emergence of ideas like the calculus or the invention of LSD or the steam engine, why these things have this curious property of being regulated from above, it's because the world is not nearly as chaotic and random as we suppose. We are actually trapped inside a giant organism. And it is not Gaia. That's a much larger organism. We are trapped inside a large organism, which is the human collectivity. And that's why we are such different monkeys, because there is this uh, group mind, which none of us is aware of or has ever perceived, that is actually mediating uh, the human experience. And it is no more apprehendable to us than the group mind of an anthill is apprehendable to us. It can't be seen. What it is, is it's an interlocking set of conventions, linguistic uh, directions, uh, genetic components, assumptions, and uh, 
what for lack of a better word you would call innate tendencies and these things which we wear as uh, as the clothing of our speciesood are actually the constraints directing us first one way and then another and if we want to take control of our destiny we are going to have to rise into empathy with this over mind this super ego and there's no reason to think this can't be done I'm sure you're all familiar with Julian Jaynes theory that until very recently in fact until Homeric times everyone heard voices in moments of crisis if you were in a moment of crisis suddenly and quite naturally a voice spoke in your head and said you know get the hell out of there or do something and everyone understood that this was God or the king or the dead king it depended on where you located in the Middle East but uh, there were people who traded between these various locations and the first cynics is what they were because they noticed that uh, over at Ur God spoke to everybody but down at Nineveh it was the dead king who everybody heard in their head and this logical discrepancy cast doubt and they became the first people to not hear the voice but to assimilate it and this is what we call the ego it is what we experience as the self something which 2,000 years ago was a god which only intervened in human affairs to save lives and give uh, heavy advice has become for each of us the uh, the central focus through which we mediate our sensorium and project models of the world so it is not uh, we are far more plastic than we realize and I think what Stan was saying tonight about how the goal is to be in the uh, I forget the term, the hylolytic, the, the matter-oriented side of it, but to have this awareness, a complete awareness of the other side, so that you are simultaneously locked in Newtonian space-time and the parameters of the situation, and you are simultaneously uh, liberated into a complete awareness of the other potential, and the way I recognize that state, and this may be uh, idiosyncratic, but I can tell I'm in that state when no matter what I'm doing and no matter where I go, I can see the earth hanging in space by simply referencing that image and discovering it present in my head in a way that is not like a thought or, a, or, or something uh, artificially induced. It's a real modality that is present and accessible and I think that means you know that you have enough of yourself committed to the overmind that you're operating in the light of it and then many consequences flow from that that are um, efficacious at the personal level for instance there's something which has been called the Tao of the ancestors what that means I think is simply that for each one of us there is a way to do the things we must do that is the most uh, energy efficient way to do it and I'm talking about opening a door picking up a fork the best way to do it is to follow the creode that is the Tao of the ancestors to recognize that you are a genetic expression a partial genetic expression of a gene pool which has received genetic expression at each generation in your family for thousands and thousands of generations and that you are just the latest recension recension of this gene pool then you release the ego and you act with this awareness these are psychedelically induced states of being that I think make it easier to live in the world and how many of them are there who knows for instance uh, under the influence of psilocybin in the Amazon I noticed what I am completely convinced is an atrophied human ability it's a very simple ability but we have lost it 
It's the ability to know how to walk from point A to point B, not following the shortest distance, but following automatically the, the uh, path of least resistance so that you don't go down into valleys and then climb hills. You automatically stay on ridges even though you take more circuitous paths to your goal. And I could feel this sense working. It was just like a part of the dashboard that had previously been covered up was uncovered. Here was a human sense, which we don't particularly need because we've erected linear cities where the most uh, the path of least resistance usually is a straight line. But you can imagine people in rugged country, this is a sense which would confer great survival adaptability and be tremendously important. So I think that the, what we need to do is tease these human abilities out of the psychedelic experience, that really the psychedelic experience is like an intimation of immortality. And at varying distances in time from the point you occupy, it shows you ever more vague intimations of the future, but they are there nevertheless. Uh, language is probably somehow related to the endogenous hallucinogens in the human brain. The evolution of culture is probably related to these things. It's been suggested that DMT in the brain is mediating what we experience as attention. That when you look and look hard, something is happening in the brain having to do with DMT. That it mediates awareness in a very moment-to-moment -moment way. Um, the future evolution of mankind is going to be based on these states. But the, the last point I want to make is one about how evolution occurs. It isn't that a mutation happens and it is, confers greater adaptability upon an individual and therefore that individual and his offspring uh, uh, numerically gain over competitor uh, individuals of the same species. This is not how it works. The way it works is you have constant uh, mutating of a gene pool from the influx of cosmic radiation and other factors. There is always a uh, low level of mutagens, uh, of mutants in a population. But they are of no consequence as long as the selective parameters remain the same. But when the selective parameters change suddenly, these individuals who were previously masked in the gen general population, the selective advantage that they have now comes immediately to the fore and they act very quickly and critically to send the evolution of a given species off in a different direction. This is why uh, the fossil record progresses in fits and starts because sudden shifts of environment cause the apparent emergence of new types. It isn't that they cause it, it's that the new types were always there, but not with any advantage. It's that the new situation has conferred a sudden advantage on them, and they are moving then into positions of uh, dominance in the population or the society, if we're talking about human beings. I think that the psychedelic experience is like that at the present level. It has conferred, uh, there is a population of different people in the general population. And as conditions change, these people will be seen to have uh, adaptive advantages uh, without being metaphysical about it. An obvious adaptive advantage is uh, what I call the deconditioning effect, that, that we live in a jungle of propaganda, you know, buy this, believe this, wear this. If, uh, if you have a symbiotic relationship with a deconditioning agent, you're much uh, more likely to thread your way through that with your soul and your bank account intact. Mm -hmm.
So uh, <laughs> this is this is one way of thinking of it. That what the what the psychedelics really do, I think, is release us from cultural machinery and put you right up against the human essence and say you no longer have to pretend that you're Scotch Irish or Witoto or Jewish. You can actually explore the human modality independent of the inertia of these exterior labels. And so it places responsibility, it uh, raises questions of validity, existential uh, 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 honesty with oneself, and I think it promotes uh, the moral life, which I don't think happens if you buy deeply into myths of the tribe, if you're a devoted practitioner of Marxism, fascism, capitalism, I don't think these things will lead you to the moral life because they are not, uh, they don't arise out of experience. Experience is everything. These are drugs of experience. Uh, it's very important to take the moment seriously, uh, reincarnation and all these things aside. What if this were your unique opportunity to unravel it all and not to be caught in dissolution. Because I think that there is, a, there is a potential for immortality, but it isn't assured. It is something which comes to the courageous. And uh, somehow in the historical experience, we've gotten the idea through orthodox religions that salvation comes to the subservient. And this is totally wrong. It is uh, more like the Greek ideal of the hero, that if you are heroic enough, once you're dead, you'll be a god. And uh, I think this is what these things summon us all to. And the thing to look at are the things which don't fit any paradigm, the anomalies, the paranormal things, the self-transforming elf machines, the UFOs, all of these things. I don't know, it has to do with this whole thing. See, the alien is an archetype, as well as whatever else it may be. I mean, if aliens didn't exist or don't exist, we would still invent them, because it, it's the other. You know, I've, I've made the metaphor that we have arrived at some kind of uh, collective puberty, where we now are fascinated by... Uh, the notion of a non-human partner. We're obsessed, as an adolescent is obsessed with sex, we're obsessed with the notion of alien love. We want this, and yet uh, we have all the feelings about it that an adolescent brings to the early sexual experiences. It seems like an abyss, a devouring, a kind of a giving up, impossible. And yet our, our historical development has led us to the place where we now realize this is possible. It's like finding out the facts of life. The facts of life are that there could be a girl next door. And now... Who's an alien? Who's an alien, of course. <laughs> what other kind of girl next door could it be? So then, hmm, there's a girl next door. And so it's not all the talk about the wonderful technical benefits that we would reap and all this. And is obviously, it isn't that. It's an erotic fascination with the notion of the other that uh, drives us. And perhaps this is why in the psychedelic experience the alien emerges so fully and completely because it is a, 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 a repressed notion. Although I've noticed in, in the, hi in the um, history of the, the phenomenology of UFO contacts, the theme, it was first a light in the sky, then we had all these exotic abductions, and then in the last four or five years there are more and more persistent stories of uh, sexual relations, pregnancies, this kind of thing. Well, this obviously means that, you know, we're growing up, we're getting older, the pressure is on to come to terms with how this thing is going to present itself.
Yes. <laughs> so, I, you know, it's hardly respectable to say these things anywhere. I mean, fortunately, I am. I work for a living, so I can say yes. these things. <laughs> but uh, the amount of anecdotal material that would come pouring forth if these things were stressed, I think, would shock everyone. And somehow it has to be taken out, and this is a really sensitive issue that I, it is very hard to talk about. How can such a screwy notion be taken out of the hands of squirrels? In other words, we have no shortage of people assuring us that aliens of all sorts are channeling left, channeling right, this, that, the other thing. How the problem is the reverse of the problem in radio telescopy, where they search the skies and get nothing. Our problem is just a cacophony of hysterical claim making. Where do you begin? You know, the Urantia book, you've got the Nine, you've got all kinds. And this is uh, not a new phenomenon. Uh, it's, uh, well, you could choose your point, but certainly since the onset of Theosophy and uh, Alice Bailey's school, and there's been a lot of channeling in the 20th century. So the problem is one of uh, filters. Which aliens do you believe, and uh, how do you tell uh, garbage from the real thing? And I think this is a problem for information theorists. It's a poker-playing problem, essentially and shouldn't be difficult to solve if we apply ourselves to it. It's just that for us, the notion of a dialogue with an interior other is uh, psychopathy. So we're very leery of that, or we're very uh, <laughs> something <laughs> of that. <clears throat> Albert or Metzner? <laughs> Anyway, I noticed that Sasha, when he described the phenomenology of psilocybin, uh, didn't say a thing about self-transforming elf machines or whispered <laughs> messages from gods and demons. He did mention demons. So uh, you're free to believe that this is the raving of an unhinged mind, but uh, you know, being a Jeremiah figure is a great tradition, and they usually have the last laugh. <laughs> Are there any questions? Uh, <laughs> really, it could be the language before we tried to build the Tower of Babel. We all shared the same language, then it got split up because we were the Ursprach. This right is there. the term for that, Ursprach, the first language. Yes, uh, it may. Uh, that's what I mean by an assembly language. But the, the things that happen on psychedelics with language just defy rational apprehension. I mean, for instance, uh, uh, I, there's a Celtic saying that poetry is made at the edge of running water. And uh, I've noticed on psilocybin at times that as you approach running water, like a river or a waterfall, you know, y there is your, you begin to think in rhyme. It's sprung verse. And it seems preposterous. And you say, you know, this is too crazy to mention to anyone. And you're right. But <laughs> nevertheless, it's happening, you know. I mean, I, and, and as you leave the river, thought becomes perfectly normal. And uh, now, and people say, well, white noise is doing this. That's an explanation. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and, uh, you know, or you look at uh, historical phenomena. Muhammad, it turns out, spoke in verse. And, and it was considered a sign of election. Glossolalia with shaman is not that, uh, not that rare. Spirit voices. I mean, but it happens without drugs all the time. Yes, although I don't know if you know this book by Sylvia Goodman called Speaking in Tongues, which is, as far as I know, the major work in English. It's done strictly from the sociological approach, but there is some physiological data, the most interesting being that on the floor of these Costa Rican churches where she did her research, after these sessions, 
they would measure pools of saliva 18 inches across deposited by single individuals also what was going on was there was a lot of hyped up you know hallelujah type stuff and then someone would fall into the glossolalia and utter a burst of it and then be like almost like a post epileptic uh, situation and they would turn to the people around them and say did I do it? Did I really speak in tongues? This is not what the DMT glossolalia is like. What it is, and I, I'll take a minute and describe it because... Do you have a recording? I'm not with me. But, but I'll describe how it comes because I, I think people often say to me, well, I took mushrooms and nothing like that ever happened. Well, the first time it happened to me was the first time I smoked DMT. And I'm not sure that it would happen on psilocybin if you didn't have a lead into it. You have to invoke it. In other words, it isn't that psilocybin causes it, and this is interesting. It's that psilocybin carries you to a place where it is possible, given several other things which seem to be necessary. So psilocybin is necessary, but not sufficient for this phenomenon. What else is required is a thing which is sort of hard to describe, but it's an attitude of expectation. It's an attitude of uh, being on the verge of communication, even though nobody else is present. In other words, you have to invoke it. And that word, strangely enough, has a history related to demonic uh, summoning and that sort of thing. But that's what you do. You invoke it. You feel the load of the psilocybin and you say aha it's enough now and then you um, test a rel you try it and you do this by consciously speaking gibberish in other words what seems to be happening is that you have to release your brain's expectation that sound will have meaning because when we all speak, we always the words have a meaning attached to them or else there's something wrong with you. But if you will speak gibberish for a moment, just for a moment, it's like priming the pump. And the break then is made with whatever connects language to meaning and language begins, it begins to flower and to take off and to develop these abstract modalities th that are free of association but that are obviously highly ordered and grammatical and going through complicated s s it's like a sonata and in fact it's led me to suggest uh, that probably language existed thousands and thousands of years before meaning that this is what monkeys, these evolving monkeys on the brink of self-reflection did for each other as a form of entertainment. It's not as much of an energy drain as chanting and singing. It's, you just carry it on at a conversational level, <laughs> but you, you know, it's word music that can very, very fine nuances of the stuff it's manipulating, which is not meaning, but whatever it is, this topological manifold, very fine nuances can be imparted to it by these small mouth noises. And is it anything like what babies who are about to learn to speak do? They exactly. carry on these things and it sounds like a language that you just don't understand. There's all this inflection and it sounds very intelligent if you could just kind of catch it. It's, it's, it's like that. Just it is very close to actual yeah. language. It's like so that, only more so. Only more complex. Like one of the things that seems to be going on is there seems to be more phonemes than are actually in any human language. I mean, isn't it that there are 52 phonemes and no language known as more than 41 or something like that? But uh, it, Because if you do this for a while and it's so much fun, it's a kind of ecstasy to do it, that there's no reason to stop if you're alone. After you've done it for an hour or so, your face, your mouth is just hanging down to your waist. I mean, it's like you've just done something to the whole front of your head and all the musculature has dissolved because you've been making all these sounds that you never make. 
and the whole front of your face feels different. So uh, every language has a set of coded mouth positions which are expected and uh, easily facilitated through use. No, there's rarely somebody there to hear it when I do it. Well, I sometimes it wish. Is it, is it easier, in other words, because I got the impression... Oh, I don't know. I mean, for instance, I'm very shy about it. I feel like it's a very personal thing to do, so that I... It's hard for me to do it in the presence of other people. But this is just perhaps my personality or my association with it. I think it. you're a better speaker in English. Well, here's what I think it is. It's, and Henry Munn made this point in his... Uh, in his uh, article and I said earlier you know that what we need is the evolution of language and it's all about the evolution of language yes it's a very it's a continuum and as I I guess it was here or it was somewhere recently I said you know it begins as a clear thought it moves into eloquence it then becomes charismatic at that point, if it goes any further, it will be called demonic possession because it's too, it's happening too much. You're not supposed to be that compelling. You're not supposed to be that powerful a speaker. And if you stick with it past demonic possession, it becomes the, it becomes these objects. It actually crosses over and becomes the topological modality that, that I mentioned. Um, Jill and I were talking in the baths the other night because she made her sounds down there and I caught it at a certain angle visually and I could see these things coming out of her mouth which looked like uh, blue smoke and I've seen this before uh, it looks like heat waves off a highway and perhaps it's nothing more than heated air that's been in the lungs, heated by the body, has a different refractive index than the exterior air. It's probably expelled in a series of waves. And so if you have the light just right, what you see is a, is a, is a uh, displacement of light, a flickering in the vicinity of the mouth. But I think I've also, in a stone state, watched that condense into this more visible language and it's as though you know there are finer and finer levels of vibration the whole notion of the word becoming flesh which occurs in cosmogonic uh, myths as diverse as the judeo-christian and the australian aborigine it's always about a word a word was uttered and this word was somehow more than a word it adumbrated through dimensions and caused the phenomenon of being and uh, uh, th this is uh, the sort of thing that's happening. But to answer your question, yes, I think that I uh, have verbal facility because I've taken so much of this drug. And maybe I had a tendency toward it at the beginning, being Irish and uh, not given to hard work. But, uh, <laughs> but nevertheless, it definitely does this, and it does it to... Uh, Temporarily, like when you take psilocybin, if you actually try to do what we call raving, which is, uh, you know, a, a, a high-speed soliloquy, but the raving can just go anywhere. And is, uh, if it's true that what we are are creatures of information, then this is very interesting, that it synergizes this uh, ability. Everything that we are doing is informational deployment. I mean, we take in raw materials and we excrete manufactured objects, which are essentially ideas. We take in air and we expel words. Everything we do is about stamping higher orders of information on unorganized lower forms of raw material. And it's... Uh, it's moving out of us, moving out of our bodies. This technical engine that we have created of computers and scientific institutions and rapacious uh, government agencies and commercial concerns, it has a life of its own. It's defining what humanity will be for itself. It's a war about language.
about uh, you know Joseph Goebbels was the the great 20th century thinker who understood this more clearly than anyone else and set the tone uh, set the rules of the game so that the deconditioning effect of the drugs the introduction to alien modalities the glossolalia the accessing of the vision state all of these things have to do with information and it, the life of its own that it is taking on and we are like the privileged observers of this it's as though well no less a uh, psychedelic voyager researcher and uh, bon vivant than william burroughs said uh, English is a virus from outer space. <laughs> and that's what I've been trying to say, and now I'm finished.